Hello and welcome to episode 35 of the chess.com rapid rating climb. If you watched yesterday's video, you will know we were one game away from the desired 2000 ELO and it didn't go so well. It's a great game, so watch it if you haven't, but mm, that stung, that stung. So we've got to make up for it in today's game where we have a Karo Khan defense. For those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Alex and the point of this series is for me to play rapid games on chess.com and essentially talk you through my thought process while I play so that you guys can get educated in especially some of the opening opening ideas of the openings I play because I try, I try to play the same openings against the same like openings from white or black. You understand what I mean. I try to play the same repertoire so that you guys can try and understand the point of those openings to encourage you to play them yourselves and then also in the post game analysis to go over some of the ideas of the game and flesh them out a bit more with the computer and so I can actually play the moves out on the board instead of drawing a bunch of arrows and expecting you to be able to follow along with it. So introduction out of the way let's play d5 you knew it was coming we're not playing some silly little perk defense like this after c6 no, no, the Chad Karo Khan opening, and the whole point is if white takes, we take back with the c-pawn, and we go, look white, you just traded off an e-pawn for a c-pawn, and central pawns should be more valuable, so nice trade. My opponent goes knight c3, this is one of the main lines, I mean in this position you can go knight to d2, knight c3, f3, e5, e takes d5, Bishop d3 is even a move that I see occasionally, so there's loads of responses. Knight c3 I think is the main classical line, and we're going to take. There is some gambit with f3 here, which I have faced a few times. I'm not really the biggest fan of it for white. I feel like black has very, very good compensation, and he goes for it. He goes for it okay. The reason I mentioned that and predicted it is because he took so long after d takes e4. So of course you're going to accept this. And we're just going to develop normally. We're going to go knight f6. And what we what we have to be careful of is this light squared bishop essentially. That is black's, sorry, white's main weapon. Moves like bishop to c4, knight to g4, castle, maybe queen f3. These are his, his ideas. And it's kind of difficult to kick this bishop out, right? What I like to play is e6. Does this block in my bishop? Absolutely. Could I have played bishop g4 in this position? No. I couldn't play that because of bishop f7, king f7, and knight to e5 check, winning my bishop. I'll go over that in the post-game analysis, so don't worry. But he castles, so... A big idea of a lot of these gambit lines for white, and it's the same in like the alien gambit, which I have a previous video on. When white sacrifices a pawn for compensation like this, black often plays e6, and white tries to put a lot of pressure on this e6 pawn, right? Currently, he only his bishop is attacking it, but soon he will be bringing more pieces to the party. And my bishop on c8 is playing a very important job of defending that pawn. Although my bishop does look passive, because it is. And you can argue for the cost of a pawn that white has a great position. And maybe he does. Again, look, he's just loading up on the six pawn. And there's always ideas of sacrificing something on it. So what we're going to do is we are going to play knight to b6. We're going to challenge this bishop reopen our bishop here. I wanted to do this maneuver before he put any more pressure on the pawn just to avoid any sacrifices. And my opponent retreats to d3, which is better than going back to b3. Because if he goes back to b3, I'm going to shove a knight on d5 and block his diagonal off forever. So d3 is a far better square, applying pressure to h7 now. But that only works if I castle. I'm not necessarily going to castle, and I might spend a very long time in the center, which, you know, could be dangerous, but might be necessary. I'm just thinking, so the move I want to play is bishop e7, and kind of just curl up into a ball. 
but I am sure C5 is the move. I know I've done an analysis in this opening before, and I'm sure C5 is the idea, and doing it sooner rather than later. It does expose the B5 square, but I should just have Bishop D7, and the knight going there isn't very scary because these squares are covered. So I'm sure C5 is the move. And the point is, if you take, then I take with the bishop. Is this potentially a little bit risky? Maybe. It also gives my position a bit more breathing room, though. And yeah, my bishop steps off... Sorry, my pawn steps off with the defense of these two squares, like I said. But, like I just said, b5 should be fine if anything goes there. And d5 is still covered by four different pieces, so... You know, that's not a problem. White's only got one piece attacking d5. He's not going to play d5 anytime soon. Although, do note that this pawn is pinned, so it's not actually taking part in the defense. Wow. Wow. So he's giving us a pawn. He's just giving us a pawn. I don't know what his intention is. Maybe... Here, here, here? That might be his point. If we take, he's not going to move this knight. He's going to deliver this check, force us to block, and then take the pawn back because our queen's connection is cut off. But then we can just trade bishops, and we're still up a pawn. So, okay, we... we can always take on d4 but let's not be hasty we could play c4 c4 is a tempting move because it kicks this bishop away from this diagonal because we control all the other squares on the diagonal so c4 bishop e2 we should calculate this because it's a forcing line what's our follow-up knight d5 um I'm not the biggest fan of that position, I don't think, because c4 seems kind of loose. Maybe you can go b3 to try and undermine it. I feel like taking here makes more sense. I don't see any inherent danger in this. What? So, okay, queen takes. If there was a queen here on d1, that would be scary, because then bishop b5 check would open up a discovery on my queen, but there's no queen there. Is that not just a free piece? There's no direct attack on my king. Knight b5 attacks my queen and attacks c7, but... We can just drop back to d8, bishop to f5, and we always have knight d5 attacking the bishop and defending c7. So here, here, and by the way, even if he gets in with this, we can recapture and we'll have two pieces for a rook. I mean, I have to take this. Here, 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 we're good. Here, bishop e3. I'm not scared of that, I don't think. We just go... Something like that. I mean, it's a free piece. We have to take that. We have to take the free piece. Yes, yeah, so we go for this. But I don't think that works. And even if it did work, then we'd get two pieces for a rook. Bishop here. Knight here. Bishop g3. a6. Knight moves. Bishop c5. Knight b3. Uh, we, 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 we don't need to calculate beyond that. What? I don't want... I, I, I think white has um, just given up and he's just throwing pieces at us because this doesn't do anything. 
Like, if I take with the queen, then he gets knight c7 check. Even then I'm fine, because like I said, if he takes, we take back. And we're up probably a piece, because he sacrificed the exchange. But yeah, this just doesn't work. Now we even have e5 as an option to block the diagonal off. But um, knight d5 looks easier. Now we do we do need to be diligent here. We can't play moves too willy nilly just because the position <clears throat> just because the position is completely winning. We still have to play the best moves. A6 looks like a no brainer because he still has some pressure going on. So let's just kick the knight away. Could you play bishop to d7? Maybe maybe he would do this. Is that scary? No, but a6 is very forcing. I don't really have to calculate a lot. Knight moves, like, easy. So here we just top a rook. Now, we do actually have to get our rooks involved into the game to prove that. The easiest way would be to trade off the queens, but our opponent isn't going to cooperate, um, obviously. Okay, so we go c4. Now, obviously, you take that because if you move the knight, if you move the knight out of danger, then he's going to deliver this check. And like I say, we're still fine, but we're less winning. Um, yeah, we take it with the queen. I'm expecting rook d1 to line up this. And I might just play bishop to d7 if he goes rook d1. Because my point is, this no longer comes with check. I mean, I can just take it regardless, actually, even if it did come with check. But I'm just defending this pawn. I'm also potentially going for bishop to c6, loading this up. I am up a lot of material, but it isn't actually that easy to prove this. Just because... My position is kind of loose, so we do have to still be diligent here. Is he threatening moves like this or this? I mean, yeah, but if, if he takes on h7, I feel like he's just doing himself harm. And if he goes to f5, he carries no actual threat. I just need to get my pieces out. Like, I'd love to play this move, but then, whoops, my bishop is going to die. So, bishop d7, where's the bishop going? Probably to e4. Um, is that, he's annoying, there's just like, it's winning, but it's just annoying to actually convert this. Really frustrating. <laughs> um, let's think. We could go e5. And after bishop to e4, we can go queen to e6. Queen is nice and safe on e6. Um, and then continue developing. We also block this bishop's diagonal. So if we go e5, does he have anything else? He also has no pawns on the f or d file to contest my e-pawn. So that's a bonus. If we go e5, he does have this. Which puts pressure on the bishop. Then... The queen goes to the C file, the rook might go to the C file. Something like this. Ugh. Here, here. Why is this so difficult? It's actually annoying. Maybe just bishop d7 is best. Bishop d7, where's this bishop going? To e4. Then we can go here. 
And if you take, I can go to d8. Although then I might run the risk of like rook c1, bishop c7. So, wait, let me just think. Bishop d7, bishop e4. I want to be accurate here because we're up a rook and two pawns. I don't want to do anything stupid. It'd be a lot easier if our king was safe, right? Bishop e7, bishop e4. Queen c5. Bishop takes b7, rook takes a2. Maybe? Although, I do want to play e5 to block off this bishop. So let's try and make e5 work. If I go e5... Bishop f5. Can I take? I don't want to, but... Uh, then he might have ideas of sacking on e5, actually, and winning the rook. So I don't want to allow that. On second thoughts. Okay, you know what? You know what? I actually don't know. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Maybe just bishop e7? Just covering the king a little bit. If he goes here. Bishop e7, bishop e4. There, and if there, then there, but then he has bishop here. Hmm. This is so tricky, unnecessarily. Just don't want to blunder anything, right? Okay, I'm going to go bishop e7. I just spent five minutes on that move. Oh my god. If you skipped ahead, then <laughs> I don't blame you. Because that should not have taken me that long. But it's actually a difficult position. Like, unless I'm missing something incredibly obvious, it's actually kind of hard to play this. Because um, I don't want to do anything stupid. Like, if I could transport this bishop here... Like, in one move, my position is immediately perfect. Because I have threats here, I control the e4 square, b5 is defended, b7 is defended. It's beautiful. But I can't do that. I didn't want to play bishop b to d7, because I was actually concerned about b7 falling. And my rook getting kind of trapped because of these two bishops, right? And the... Uh, Dark squared bishop always having the opportunity to come to c7 and cover d8. If I end up giving up my rook for a bishop, that's not the end of the world. Because remember, I'm up a rook and two pawns. So if I can defuse his attack uh, by giving up an exchange, that's chill. Because I'm still up a bunch of material. So I don't see a way to do that. And in the previous episode, um, if you've seen that, then you know I had a completely winning position up like a knight... I was up like a knight and a pawn or something, and I just completely blundered the game. Um, I mean, it wasn't quite that quick, but I just played a couple of stupid moves and got myself into a whole world of trouble. So I don't want to do that again. And I feel like that's one of the things that changes as you get towards 2000 Delo, is that people keep fighting and they're relentless and even if they've got losing positions they'll find some really interesting resources so okay okay we we know bishop e4 is the move again you might be looking at bishop e5 because you're like oh that comes with check and a discovered attack yeah but then my queen takes and dodges the attack so bishop e4 looks like the move no other move looks logical. Again, taking on h7 just helps us. 
Bishop e2. Maybe his point is to keep eyes on um, b5. That's an interesting move. I want to play queen c6. And if he goes bishop to f3, then queen a6. Just to step out of any attack. That looks good to me. That looks good. And it's important that this square is covered by my bishop because, um, oh my god, arrows, please. So I wouldn't want the rook getting in and causing problems. Yeah, I wasn't so thrilled about putting my queen on b6 because of bishop to f2, applying further pressure. Yeah, it's just a difficult position. And I think this is actually... Um, like kind of thematic of the opening in general even all the way back here black's position is cramped and although we've gone up a bunch of material the position is still cramped uh okay so yeah he's attacking my queen he still has pressure on b5 pawn probably a smart approach from him but i think queen to a6 followed by bishop to d7 makes a lot of sense Again, here, I don't like this. Well, or um, bishop c7 potentially as well. There are some openings where a queen gets trapped with moves like bishop c7, which is always quite funny. Well, depending on which side you are. Just worried about this playing on the pin, but I think I can just take it. Because there's no rook to a1. Again, I really don't want to be blundering anything got to watch out for these kind of things just in case <sighs> I don't know whether castling is worth it maybe castling and putting the king on h8 is safe because this bishop actually struggles to access these dark squares again if I could teleport this bishop to c6 in one move my position is perfect and white has to stop me from doing this. And I'm sure he knows this. That if my bishop goes on to c6, I'm sorted. He holds everything. Closes the c-file. Defends b5. Defends b7. I could even move the bishop to d5 if I want to. Pressures g2. And every, everything's perfect. I can maybe play rook to d8. It's game over. But uh, he's not going to let me do that easily. Another move on the radar, now the rook has shifted to the c file, is bishop d6. Like I was saying before, the bishop controls a d6 square so that he couldn't infiltrate himself. But now that his rook's moved, I could potentially use that square to try and trade bishops. And if he plays a move like bishop f2, then I could go bishop to e5 to, to keep eyes on some targets. And remember, like I said when I was thinking about playing e5, there are no pawns on the f or d file. So if my bishop were to land on e5, it would be a perfect outpost because there's no pawns on these files to kick it out, right? And it just acts as a bit of a wooden shield, especially because it's protected by the f-pawn and protects the f-pawn. Interesting move. So my immediate instinct is to play bishop to d6, but I think his point is bishop takes, queen takes, and bishop to b5, because my queen steps off of the defense. So again, that's a nice move, and it's just putting pressure on my position. I can consider bishop to d8 kicking the rook out, but I don't think that's necessary. I think bishop to d7, just defending here, renewing this idea, because b5 will be defended now. And then I c if I can shift the bishop to c6, that's great. I could even do it in this move order if I so want. He he's applying pressure well, though. Making logical moves. Again, a4 is not a threat. And move to consider is queen to a5, which attacks the rook and threatens a queen trade. And of course, um, I would be more than happy to give up the b5 pawn to get a queen trade. But he should just have queen to c1, defending the rook and moving off of the queen trade. And then 
his position just improves. I just help him to improve his position, so I'm not going to do that. Bishop d7, looks logical. Let's do it. Again, it kind of relieves some stress I have about this pawn. Although he could, like the R ideas of sacking the rook. So I'm going to feel a lot better if I can get this bishop to c6. So that if the rook ever sacks itself, I can always take with the pawn. And my problems are kind of solved. Again, this move is on the radar to try and force a trade. But like I said, in this position, if I do that, take, take, well, actually... If um, I go bishop d6, he can play bishop 2, b5 immediately. And after takes, he can take there. And I'm in a bit of trouble. In a bit of trouble. Or he could do it like this way around if he wants to keep the light squared bishop on the board. Because I can't play bishop d7 because the rook controls the square alongside the bishop. I'd have to go king 2, f8, really. Maybe that's okay, but... I, it's just walking into lots of complications. Like I said, if I can just get my bishop here, or if I can play a move like rook c8 under the right circumstance, or rook d8, I'm going to feel a lot better. And also, if he starts to shift a lot of his pieces over to the queen side, which he is doing, he is doing, you know, these pieces are all looking this direction then I can at any moment just castle and evacuate my king. But currently my king needs to act as a defender of these pieces. The move I'm expecting... The move I'm expecting is queen to d2, eyeing up h6 and eyeing up my bishop. If queen to d2, I should be able to play bishop to c6. This looks a little bit scary. Because after takes, takes, he's threatening mate. But I have bishop takes g2 check, king takes, and queen takes queen. So that's an important line to know. Because like I said, if my bishop lands on c6, then I'm targeting the weak pawn. And he goes queen d2. So bishop c6 looks like an incredible move. Because I'm also preparing rook to d8. And if I can do... Like I said, if I could do both those moves in one go, problem solved, like, game over. I am, however, worried about rook takes e7. Here. 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 I should be safe, because I'm good on the light squares. And I can always bail out with bishop to g2 check and trading the queens if I need to. So bishop c6, like I said, this, we, we know this doesn't work, right? Here, if he takes, then it's easy. Here, and he takes, and we take. This is the scary line. But king back to e8, and we should be good. We could play this, but I think bishop c6 is a bit easier. Let's do it, and let's pray to the gods. Or singular god. Or maybe chess has many gods. Maybe chess is polytheistic. Who knows? Let's try and clean this game up now. My opponent's done a very, very good job of um, making this difficult for me. Like I I said, you know, around 2000 ELO, players start to get incredibly resilient and they keep on fighting. And they just want to make your life difficult. I might end up getting into a situation if the queen comes into h6 where I start boxing up like this and just surrounding my king with pieces. Um, which, I mean, isn't the prettiest of configurations, but... I'm up a rook and two pawns. Like, if that's what I need to do to survive, then I'll do it. Um, yeah, this rook f6 move is actually call is actually causing me some issues. Again, I still should 
I know I'm completely winning. Unless I've missed some obscure line in this position. But like I said, this shouldn't work. Because I can just take it. And here, 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 I should just be able to go king to e8. And if he takes, takes, and he goes bishop to d6, then again, I can just step back and I'm good. And like I said, importantly, this, this bishop is doing a fantastic job. Absolutely bang up job of monitoring the light squares. Also blocking the c file because this rook is kind of stranded now, right? And dying g2. This bishop might be the hero of this game. Uh, by the way, if you're still watching the video, then I would assume you're enjoying it. And I'd really appreciate if you could drop a cheeky little like. And if you're not already, please do subscribe so that you can get recommended my videos a bit more often. Uh, I upload every single day. Ever since I uploaded my first video, it's been every single day. And I just got monetized. So it's kind of crazy. He does take on e7. Um, of course, we're going to take back. And like I said, this should be fine. And I can even bail out with um, sacking my bishop to force a queen trade, which would get us into a two rooks versus two bishops position, which is obviously completely winning. So I don't really see any other plans for him. Maybe he wants to do this. Again, king to e8. Um, he has no threats because we're so solid on the light squares. I think that's actually just like incredibly characteristic of the Karo Khan in general. Like, we've lost our dark squared bishop, so you can argue our dark squares are kind of weak. But because of our pawn structure, this pawn was on c6 before it went to b5, obviously. Because of our pawn structure, our light squares are so solid that this light square bishop is kind of locked out of the game because the only useful diagonal we occupy. Okay, bishop d6. Don't go here. It's probably a fine move because there's actually no useful discoveries. But don't step into the line of attack. Just go king to e8. Rook d8 is on the cards. Okay, he goes here. This is not really scary. Um, he's threatening f6, which is kind of annoying, but I'm also keeping an eye out for these tactics when possible. Rook g8 is tempting to go after g2, because I can't actually defend g uh, f6 this move. This is also a tempting move to pressure the bishop. The queen here, though. Rook takes here, here. I'm up a whole rook. And I get rid of the threat. Uh, so that might be a good way to go about this. I'm going to do it. Oh my god, I'm, I'm down to like four seconds. Why do I allow this to happen? Honestly, it's so bad. If he goes here, obviously don't move your rook because that is checkmate. That would be a... Uh, very unfortunate way to end the game. I am aware of his back rank weaknesses, but I don't see a way to actually exploit them. Which is why I haven't. I was thinking about bishop to a... Sorry, queen to a2. But then queen to f6, queen to... What is that? Um, okay. Why is that actually a good move? Oh my god, I'm going to run out of time. My dark squares are so weak. And I've just weakened them even more. Because I was worried about f6. Ugh. So little time. So little time. I'm going to have to shut up a little bit. So apologies, but... I need to try and close out this game. Because my opponent is making this very difficult for me. Ah, shit, I had this move. And if he took, I could have gone here. Then here. No, that's so complicated. I wouldn't have seen that. I mean, it's winning, but I, I wouldn't have seen it. Like, the whole line in time. Ugh. Uh, 
this is, I think, why trying to take the rating climb to above 2,000 ELO is going to be impossible. Because I don't think I'm good enough to be able to give, provide this level of commentary, which I think is quite educational, and play well. As you can see, I'm just running out of time. So I'm looking at queen to e5, rook to g8, eyeing up g2. What is that move? It's threatening mate, great. I didn't want to play this because I was worried about the back rank. So I'm just going to block like that. Oh my god. Wait, what? Wait, how do I stop mate? No. How do I stop mate? I think... Wait. I'm winning? Is... Oh my god, I could have taken the bishop. I could have taken the bishop. Oh my god. <laughs> Genuinely infuriating. Genuinely infuriating. He just kept on posing problems. I can't believe that. <sighs> Was it better to go here? Have to check? It's just repeating though. So surely this is the... Maybe the idea is to sack and then castle. Wait, why can't I castle? Oh, my king, my king moved. I forgot. <laughs> Maybe just rook to g8, eyeing up here, and I guess I'm just up a lot of pawns. If this. Take, take, that's mate. Oh, I can't believe this. I, ha I, I just had to take. And I'm still good. I'm still winning. I mean, here, if I take, then queen take. Something like rook to d5. I'm apparently winning. Oh, that's infuriating, man. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> it, it almost seems like I'm intentionally prolonging this uh, rating climb by just losing for no, like losing completely winning positions as I get up to um, almost 2,000. Like it's it's kind of comedic, but again, like I said in the last game, like this is. This is the reality of chess. Like, I can play a perfect, pretty perfect game. I, I've got a feeling it's a pretty perfect game. Up until navigating, um, like, this position, um, I don't think f5 was good. I mean, it's a move, but it's not great. And, uh, yeah, here, it's completely ruined the position for myself, but... Let's see what the computer has to say. Um, I was up so much material. So much material. Well, boys, a loss is a loss, but we can learn from it nonetheless. 84.9% accuracy for me that game. 78.9% for my opponent. Very high accuracy game still, but um, yeah, frustrating. So, like I said, in this position, the Kairo Khan, White has an absolute ton of moves. He chooses knight to c3, which I think is the main move, and we take. And, um, I mean, typically the knight takes back, and I've got a bunch of uh, videos when my opponent takes back, but he goes f3. This isn't uncommon. Take, take. White does have some compensation. We go knight f6, bishop to c4, e6. I'm pretty sure bishop g4 is better. Maybe? Apparently b5. Yeah, I don't really want to play b5. 
5. I think the point is that if bishop to b3 is played, then e6, and the bishop shut out from the game forever, and if he goes back to d3, g6 apparently, and if castle, I'm just checking this because I might use this um, in the future. What's the most natural move for white here? Let's say bishop to g5. Looks pretty natural. I can just castle. And I guess I'm just up a pawn. Okay. Well, we go e6. Castle. Knight bd7. Queen to e1. And apparently this is a mistake. Which I find hard to believe. Um... Bishop d3, and I'm just not good. But I do find c5, and I don't know why it's giving that an inaccuracy, because it says it really likes it. Although apparently bishop e7 first is better. But c5, um, yeah, I expected him just to not react. But he plays king h1, which was just odd. Of course, if he takes, then we take back with the bishop. Moves the king. I assume he doesn't want to trade bishops. And yeah, maybe we just continue to develop. But I think the point is that the position is still a bit weird. And the computer's screaming for like bishop back to e7. But here, like, it's not a fun position. Um, but I kind of curl up into a bit of a ball. So I think I will be keeping this b5 move in my back pocket from now on. And after bishop d3, just going for a fianchetto setup. So that's good to know. Um, yeah, but anyway, we get here. And I'm not expecting him to take back. I'm expecting knight to b5 to try and win this pawn back. If we go bishop to c5. Apparently queen g3 or queen h4 is good. And white's fine. But he takes, which is just odd. Oh, quickly, I forgot I was going to show you something. Uh, here, bishop g4 is not a good move because of bishop takes f7 check. King f7, knight to e5, attacking the king and attacking the bishop. So king moves, takes, takes, takes. White emerges up. Actually, equal material because he sacked a pawn, remember. But the position is fantastic for white. The black king is exposed. The rook is unable to develop. Black King Heart Castle, obviously. And Black's pieces are really misplaced. So, yeah, sorry, I forgot I was going to mention that. But Knight B5, Queen D8, Rook F6 is just like, what? I was expecting this straight away, but just Knight BD5 and I'm good. Rook F6, GF6, Bishop F4, Knight D5, Bishop G3. I explained the reasons for these moves during the game. A6. C4, takes, takes. This is a good approach from my opponent because he's messing up my pawn structure. and Potentially, you know, exposing this diagonal. Rook D1. Okay, Bishop E7 is the best move. So I'm happy I found that. I wasn't sold on Bishop D7 because of Bishop 2 E4, Queen to C5. Bishop takes B7. And it's tough to know where to put my rook. Because if I go rook to d8, I was concerned about rook to c1. Ah, I can go back to attack the bishop. And then this doesn't work, because of course I just go for this. Well, it was tough to see that far ahead, but bishop e7 is the best move. Bishop e2 is also a good move. Back to c6, rook c1, queen a6, rook c7, bishop d7. Again, I explained the reasons for these moves during the game. I was a little bit worried about a4, trying to play on this pin, but I can just take with the queen. I guess he can then win b7, but I should be fine. It's just so difficult to play this position with black, because the king's so exposed. Like Even though you're a rook up, this rook isn't in the game. And you can argue this bishop isn't really in the game either. Um, very difficult. Queen d2. We go bishop c6, which is is the best. Rook d8 was also playable. Interestingly, the computer doesn't mind castling and just giving up this bishop. Trying to play for back rank mate. 
because you can't take here because um, once you sack a ton of pieces, it's mate. So queen a2, let's say h3, bishop d8, rook b7, queen b2. This is a very strange way to play. Like realistically, I'm just not going to play like this. Bishop c6 is the best move anyway. And he takes on e7 and he makes my life hard. There, there. Queen f4. Again, here I I don't mind rook to d8. Bishop a3. Apparently rook g8 is the move here. Queen a5. Well, queen a5 is fine. Threatening this, but queen a4. I feel like that forces a queen trade. I mean, you can't take on f6. So, uh, I think, yeah, I explained this during the game. Bishop f1. Oh my god. This is a move. <laughs> what a move. You attack the queen. You're threatening mate, obviously. And you're defending mate. Like, by x-ray. And if you take here, then king d7. And white has no checks. And if you go something like h3, oh, the pawn's pins, you're getting mated anyway. That's hilarious. But I think um, simpler, I think I calculated this during the game. Um, rook d1, bishop f1, b4. And after you take, I can go king to... I can actually go king to e7, because this bishop's blocked off now. And this is why I was calculating, because the bishop hangs and this bishop hangs. So who, if you go for something like h3, I mean, I can just take here and then take here. And I'm up so much material. I missed this, though. So I played f5 out of panic as well, because I just had no time. Queen c7. b4 is an option here, apparently. And if you take my queen, then you're getting mated. Wow. And I guess I'm threatening mate as well, because rook to d1, bishop d1, queen f1. Um, rook d7 is apparently better, but then queen c8 check, and it's a repetition. So I don't count that move. The other move is to take on a3, and after b takes a3... Rook g8, bishop f3, takes, takes, and rook d1 would be mate. Should have found it. Bishop d7, queen c5. I missed queen c5. And I think the reason was, I saw queen 2 d6 if I moved the bishop, but I was like, oh, my queen defends that square. But I missed queen c5 because I guess the bishop was blocking the queen's access. So in the time trouble, my brain just missed it. And, um, yeah, I just missed that I could do this. And I'm still winning here. It's not as winning, but it's a winning position. Um, I should have found this, really. I really should have found this. Um, yeah, that's very frustrating. We're down to 1975 ELO. I hope that I've maintained... You know, a fairly decent level of energy, despite my obvious disappointment with the game. But, on the bright side, I did play incredibly well. All game, up until the end, where I just faltered due to time problems. I don't I don't really want to play much longer than 15 minutes aside, because then the video is going to be, like, well over an hour. If you guys would be a fan of that then let me know. Like, I wouldn't mind doing 30 minutes aside, because it would give me ages to explain my thought process, but there's two problems with that. One, like I say, video length would be very, very long. I don't know if you guys would want to watch more than an hour, because these are already long as it is. And two would be simply the amount of people that play that time control. 15 plus 10 is already not a very popular time control, but doing like 30... Not many people play that. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the game, and we'll, we'll get them next episode. We'll get them next episode. Like I say, it does mean that the Rating Climb series continues, so I guess you can see that as a positive. 
But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. I hope you can laugh at my incredibly stupid blunders. And I'll see you in the next video.